Far from the sense of human struggle, my brethren, the hosts of light preserve sacrosanct the glories of God in divine writ and the power of the ineffable word as cosmic action for and on behalf of universal love out picturing in the world of form as peace, goodwill, felicity, and progressive knowledge in the things of the spirit. We who serve in the courts of divine grace are ever then active to seek as to how we may better instruct mankind following today in the world of the visible in the pursuit of Christ's happiness and God magnificence. The curtain veil of reality swept aside reveals the immortal glory that pulsates within the soul as the life thereof. But men must understand clearly how that they have a sovereign responsibility, not of necessity toward the outer person, but toward the pure Son of God that is within, the radiance of the eternal, the invocative word that in the beginning sounded forth and wrought the wonders of creation. Creative action is not dead. God lives in man, and he lives to create and fashion in the sanctuary of each sovereign individual the wondrous magnificence of himself in action. God draws aside the curtains, the veils of illusion, and all that hides the multi-splendored God magnificence, the splintered sun that through the human monad manifests as a pockmarked manifestation in most individuals a sprinkling of salt and pepper illusion, some bright spots and some gay, whereas others are indeed darkened and opaque. It is the purpose of the master of the light to draw aside the veil of illusion from every soul, that that soul may see the beauty of infinite wholeness that God has fabricated as the divine image of that soul but men themselves must pay allegiance to the God within, to the flame that pulsates on the altar of being, and perceive that as they serve with divine reality, to recognize by the power of the eye that the true M of being will manifest as divine ideation and the magnificence of character fashioned after the eternal within the force field of the individual seeming separate apart from the whole. Now I come then to speak of light. Light is eternal. It identifies with life. And in the wholeness of the light, men may see no darkness at all. But by contrast with darkness, the light is more brilliant, rendering itself more brilliant against the backdrop of man's incomplete manifestation with the gray tones, the shadows, and the darkness. Yet it is God's will that men should shun the darkness and cleave to the light and absorb the infinite sense of God happiness that in the universe is, that in man is, that in the mind illumined is, that in the life committed is, that God in that one is. The reality of the stars cannot be touched by the flesh of men. The light of the stars may be perceived from distant sources long ago rendered potent upon these luminous orbs, but now coming into manifestation 
in the time-spatial continuum and perceived by men of this century that left those luminous orbs long ago in other centuries and eras of time. Yet those perceiving that light today know not as to whether or not the light sources thereof are still emanating the warmth of cosmic fires. They may be dead, decaying, or dying worlds. They may be returned to the parent sun, their evolutions now having completed their cycle. So we may deem and wisely so that every man must pursue the reality of the moment of the eternal now as the doorway to the past and the luminous gate to the future. Men must perceive that the gift of life held within their own hand, pulsing within their heart, is ever most precious. It is opportunity per se, opportunity that draws back the veil, that sunders the illusion and brings to man's attention the here and the heretofore and all that is to come as the manifestation of the eternal one. Reality then is light, light pulsing through the universe and through the world of the individual, illumining the mind and heart and raising men upward step by step upon the ladder of life until they come to that consummate reality whereby God and man are one. In our brotherhood eternal, the essential release that we ourselves seek is the identification of all that we now are with all that God is. We fully understand that step by step, even from higher octaves of light, we must step backward and then forward through the veils of illusion and into the light. We step backward only that we may gaze upon the light and understand it ere we plunge into it. But we quickly step forward and move at rapid pace toward that goal which we have once determined as our own. You do well to examine the fabric of that which you seem to see as reality, for the psychic world is full of myriad bright illusions which are ploys and decoys set before the young soul to distract him from the immortal goal, to keep him from the sense of right and rend him blind by error's plight. Understand then, in the name of holy liberty and wisdom, that men ought to examine by the balance of the flame within their heart all conditions that come to them and determine definitively as to whether or not that which claims to be light is light indeed. Are you of the immortal Christ and do you seek to glorify God and not person? This is the acid test that dispels illusion. You can easily determine the price of holy wisdom and receive the fullness of the sword of cosmic discrimination by invoking from the very heart of God the perception of the cosmic Christ. Determine that no illusion shall blind your eyes to double vision, to see first to the right and then to the left with the eye that beholds on the one hand good and on the other evil. Bring yourself to the apex of the triangle of infinite light vision. Come to the top, to the summit, and understand that the third eye, the apex of the triangle, is that in which God has placed the all-seeing luminous orb of vision perception for the ages to reveal the wonders thereof to the aspirant. We who serve understand how that man plundered 
by his reckless sense of seeking to sweep from left to right and from right to left does ever defraud himself. But when he gazes upward to the single eye vision and perceives that which is light action as light, as the power of the cosmic Christ, as the power of the white mantle of universality, and perceives his own self as identifying with that universality, he understands all things in the light, and he is no longer blinded by the illusion of man having functioned constantly in that confusing manifestation which vacillates momentarily, first pursuing the path to God illumination supposedly as self-righteousness committed, and then the pathway left-handed into self-service and personality where the individual is lost in a sea of earth miasma and psychic meanderings, wandering among the delusions of past centuries, the confusions of past lives, the mysterious illusions that rise in the consciousness as dream, that come into the consciousness as so-called nightmare, that come at night as well as by day, and that speak of the glory of that which was and of that which is, but defraud mankind from the glory of that which is to come. For that which is to come, that which is the real, can only be revealed by the light. And the light shows every man as being derived from the divine source, and there is no sorcery in it, but only the clear seeing of the crystal shining mind of God. And thus I espouse light to you tonight, as the means whereby all things may come clear. Oh, how beautiful is the mind when the mind is made to be a chalice of opportunity to sense the divine, when the mind is recognized as possessing the potential of reaching out from the self and drawing in the strands of God's light that wholly blaze throughout the firmament and are everywhere pulsating the divine will, the divine love, the divine intelligence, the intelling of the Supreme One within the domain of the self is like the sound and tone of a great bell. There is a rhythm, a pulsation, a feeling of oneness that makes of every soul a bonded whole, and no separation comes into manifestation then, no sense of frustration that causes an individual to demand attention from his fellow men, but ever a yearning for more of the great God flame, for the flame of illumination, the golden flame that pulsates and is triumphant as divine in telling love. And then the soul reaches out to find the love of God as the pulsing of native reality and pristine creation, the first love of the eternal for his creation, born in the new sun as the pristine love of that sun for the one. And all things coming then under the ray of power and faith derived from the Godhead the intent to pursue and not cast the self aside into the mass sea of human energy and psychic effluvia to be devoured as by a many hydra-headed dragon. Nay, Tiamat is stilled, and in his place the beauty of the infinite one shines forth to create new pathways into the realm of heaven, new glowing roads that lead to the eternal gateway where man can see and perceive the true sense of being. Oh, how beautiful is the Christ mind, and I extol it tonight among you because individuals are from time to time wangled and wrangled by their own outer consciousness and all of its old pursuits which are time-worn and care-worn which have taken a frightful toll of their own precious being 
which have caused them to be passed over the hot coals of regret again and again and to tire of necessity early when with the infinite love, light, and faith pulsing within their being they could mount up as on eagle wing and pursue cosmic virtues and be unafraid. Be unafraid then to walk into the light, but take heed that the light that is in thee be not darkness. Be certain that the light that is within thee is the mind of Christ. Be certain that it pulsates to love. Be certain that it pulsates and energizes by divine intelligence the intelling of the wonders of the Father's love for the created Son. Be certain that it speaks of the bond of heaven that frees hearts to love one another without hope of some human fulfillment. Life is God and the fulfilling of his holy wisdom at the culmination of each cycled stairway to the stars of being is in the ineffable love, wisdom, power, context the all-seeing eye of vision, penetrating illusion, delusion, confusion, curtained aperture, and entering into the heart of the whole, the spirit that pursues and is all that is infinite intelligence perusing in man and commanding man to obey because thus God does convey, because thus God does convey, because thus God does convey the gift he desires to give and the son he seeks will live because he lives and be because he is. Thus we show forth cosmic intelligence within you but often ignored, within you but seldom in truth adored, within you but seldom known. It is yours now to own, to be, to free, to see, Tis I, tis me, tis all. Tis thee, both great and small. Templed dome of God beneath the sun. Make all hearts then by true wisdom one. Adore and love the God above, the God within, the flame begin to pulsate, rise, and be no more a thing for God or man to despise. Oh, sense it not, for tis not true, the virtue of heaven's within you, and he will lift you by his love to chalice shelter, born above, lifting souls and all who live to the place they can forgive themselves and all that lived and be the fullness of that which only God can give. He lives within you to give yourself to him. He lives within you to start tonight, begin, relinquish illusion and confusion, and by love pursue the truth, the pathway, eternally magnificent. In the name of the eternal God, we who are the brotherhood of the royal Teton, Masters of the Great White Brotherhood, founders of a cosmic dynasty, 
reveal the glowing emblem of our faith, cosmic illumination to the race, strength, every problem to face, light, every shadow to erase. Ours is the pattern of the God-ordained sons of heaven. Ours is yours to command. For freedom's sake, dispel illusion by God's mind. In God's mind dwells no earth confusion. In God's mind is the clarity, the beauty, the crystal flowing stream it pulses through you now. God's mind is not a dream. It is reality and oh how we bless it. cosmic purpose. We deal with purpose for every man, for the conception of holy righteousness that was the God design for every son of God was one and not many. Therefore life came forth from the heart of light and manifested the love of the Eternal One, even as the seeking heart of man in embodied form arose and commenced his long journey back to the heart of reality as a God-conscious, self-conscious individual who merged with the purposeful ideas of the Eternal One purposeful for the eternal purpose, concealed often by outer illusion, is the complete manifestation in every individual monad of the God force field of the great central sun, the pulsations in miniature of that sun where the forte of the eternal Christ and the vestments of every son of heaven intended to be worn and to be externalized and to be magnified. Always man 
was beckoned onward by the transcendence of the eternal purpose and always diversion in the person of serpentine energies moved through the trees of Eden and created the subtle lie, thou shalt not surely die. Only life could live eternally and pulsate eternally with the consciousness of goodness, unity, and purpose. Lesser purposes must fade, must pass away into the transcendence, if no other way, of the Eternal One. It is utterly impossible that the veils of evil spawned by mankind in ignorance and passed from one to another as an infection of callous hearts should survive and continue to harass the immortal soul in its glistening pure whiteness of seeking reunion with the Eternal One. And therefore, that which erred in man must die, be severed, be separated, and come apart from the wholeness of the whole. The ascension, then, is the natural outpicturing of the immortal purpose for each life stream. It is culmination of manifestation in form and freedom from form and form concept. It is embellishment of the soul with the immortal wind of the Holy Spirit, the power to be here and to be there, the power to be everywhere, to become a tenant of the universe rather than one excluded from this and that place where God is. Let men understand then that it is the wholesome intent of the Eternal Father to perform the ritual of bestowal upon the Divine Son. This means freedom to everyone who will accept it and an intensification of the desire of the soul for reunion with itself in its shining purposeful, God-magnified design. The design in which God himself was wrought. For what God hath wrought is also the creation of the immortal image and the eye mage, the magic of the eye, is the magic of the I am. It is the magic of being which rises and pulsates from the density and the darkness through mutation and through transmutation until fulfillment greets the soul that is far too long languished midst the densities of mortal reason and the pollutions of the world mind. Now we come to an era when God freedom can and will be bestowed at inner levels upon the soul. Those who desire to be fashioned as counterparts of the divine will also understand that there is a need for personal severance from those issues about which too much protestation has been made. And I reference here the human problems, the human problem areas in which men are immersed to their own hurt. Freedom must come as the natural outbreathing of life itself as the coolness of the waters, as the stillness of the pond, as the soft movement of the white fleecy cumulus across the sky, as the gentle rain 
that falls upon the earth and brings refreshment or the dew dispelled by the morning sun. As chrysalis, the opening up of the higher self and the leaving of the cocoon of ignorance. As beauty in flower and fruit as seed time and harvest, as winter, as spring. Everything has its place and there is a place for everyone in the universe, but the place must be claimed. Men today stake out their claim for gold or oil or the treasures of mortal, mundane consciousness, desires to express opulence before its fellow men. Those who would have the treasures of heaven must understand the need to govern the restless energies of earth and command themselves free. First, it may seem as though I utter a hard thing, but I say to you, it is the doorway to freedom through which we walked. And there are none upon the planet who will obtain their freedom in any other way. Those who enter any other way would be thieves and robbers. And this would violate the laws of a mortal unison. The laws of unison decree that harmony between the heart of the universe and each monad must come. This cannot come where there is a disturbance in the feeling world of any individual in embodiment against any other individual in embodiment. So long as there is one iota of thought and feeling registering within the flesh form of individuals, they are separating themselves from the pulsations of eternal unity, of eternal unison, of eternal harmonium. There is no other way to freedom except absolute forgiveness to the universe and to every life stream in manifestation, ascended or unascended, that may have ever at any time in all creation have wrought harm to your world individually or collectively or in any other way. And in addition to forgiveness, there must be a dispelling of the illusion of separation of the individual from the whole. That which separates the individual from the wholeness of itself is all the curtains of doubt, inadequacy, fear of attainment, competitive spirit against one's fellow men, even in spiritual things, and also the acceptance of the arrows and slings of the darkness of man's own misfortunes in which they rage and send out into the universe. Acceptance of these conditions must be denied by all. Men must understand that there is a divine impetus, a radiation, an intensification of the holy will of God manifest in the Holy Spirit. And they must understand that the Holy Spirit is the purity of God upon the earth planet. That the Lord Maha Chohan holds that energy and by it molds mankind in accord with the will of heaven. And the will of heaven is a dominant will. A dominant will of a dominant purpose. The purpose of God. And all men ought to enjoy the relinquishment of personal accomplishment, the sense of personal selfhood by dedicating their total energies to this grandiose image of the Eternal One, the Eternal Father. They ought to rejoice and fall upon their knees in consciousness that the eternal God has so loved the world that he has given the energies of his only begotten Son 
called light to bring into manifestation the warp and woof of all creation visible and invisible. What mankind have done with the creation once it was given to them how they have poisoned it by their own thinking and feeling is another story to which we hope we may write finis one of these days and disband the karmic board for this planet because it will no longer be necessary to arbite its destiny. Men do not grasp the intricacy of the divine design. They do not realize the intensity of heaven and its fervor on behalf of mankind and for the cause of freedom whereby God lavishes upon every soul the image of himself and has denied that image to none, yet every one has denied it unto themselves who have denied it. And many, yea, most of mankind, year in and year out, do deny and do not affirm their union with God, their oneness with the Christ, their totality of involvement with universal evolution, with cosmic comprehension, with immortal freedom, with the brotherhood of light, with the standards of our conduct, and with the purity of heaven's release of energy. Now then, tonight, coming on the wake of St. Germain's address of this morning, I am come to intensify the ascension currents for those who are able to grasp the meaning thereof, to understand that our purposes are not purposes to be trifled with. If men have honored the world, then they ought the more to honor God's world. And in all reality, my brothers and sisters of light, the world is also God's world. And all the things that are in the world perpetuate to him. And no thing in the world perpetuates or inures to the benefit of any among mankind only for the short span of perhaps above three score and ten. We then, who have dedicated ourselves unto God for eternity, have been made a part of that net of eternity. Our values are eternal values. Our love is eternal love. Our love is unconditioned by mortal reason. Our thoughts unmoved by mortal emotions or ideas. We are enamored only by his purposes for men, for his purposes for us, for his purposes for the universe, and for all worlds whatsoever. To expand the consciousness of men is our purpose. To create in men a greater hunger and thirst after righteousness is our purpose. To deny the hordes of shadow ingress into your world is our purpose if you will accept it. And there is no mortal delusion that is worth retaining in order to prevent the inflow of the beauty of heaven which does not gush in nor rush in but flows by the gentle ministration of acceptance by men of the love of God for men. Our love for men is a love for their souls, for the purity of their souls, for the expansion of the divine nature, for the overcoming of vicious situations, whether they be of karmic origin or sent as hostile arrows of misfortune against the light. Stand, face, then, and conquer, and know your immortal destiny. Know the purposes for which I am come this night to speak to you, to create a new sense in you of the imminence of your own ascension in the light, if you can but grasp that this is the will of God for every man, and not solely for yourselves. To accept it for the earth, for others, 
is to bring it about more speedily within your own world. To deny it to the earth is to deny it to yourself. The unity of life is seldom recognized by men and becomes often a mere philosophical point which men prate upon and understand not, neither reason not in their hearts, nor in their minds, nor are moved by, but languish in thought and in action, leaving the action to us as the coda of cosmic purpose. We do not despise that mace of authority, nor do we deny our willingness to pick it up and hold it high as a standard before the eyes of men. But we are less visible than yourselves to the eyes of men. And they behold more the screen of illusion in which you move than they behold the screen of masterful ideas in which we move. They are captivated by illusion. And the splendid radiance of divine purpose hid from their eyes. Now then, in you we see a hope as you drink into it, whereby we may change the face of the world through the acceptance of these cosmic Christ ideas which have always existed from time immemorial. And I ask you tonight, as I fling forth my challenge literally into your face, I ask you tonight, what excels our offer? What excels the offer of God? Greater wisdom? Can one exceed the wisdom of the divine? Or can one find a greater phrasing than the lost word? Blessed ones, can one find a greater goal than the divine goal? Can one create a body of flesh and blood that will endure all things and inherit the kingdom of God contrary to cosmic law? What body then will men use in order to attain their immortality. It must be a changed body. You cannot enter in with the corporeal sense into the incorporeal world. The law requires that you shall develop the wedding garment of the Lamb. That you shall wear the wedding garment of the Lamb. That you shall wear the spotless raiment of the Lamb of God, the harmless, meekness, innocent understanding of eternal purpose that harms no man and is ever accepting the will of God. Open then your eyes and see, witness how that this energy in yourself can create now as it has in us the means for sustaining the incorporeal presence, the incorporeal body, the body of the spirit. But understand that men come in with soul and soul is the means by which spirit, that is the spiritual body, is actually composed. Soul then marred by the image of mortal imperfection cannot be the mirror chalice into which God can reflect the grail image. When purification occurs in the domain of the chalice mirror, when the soul will outpicture the beauty of the eternal God in mind, in consciousness, in feeling, in thought, in love, in power, in freedom from density, in victory every hour, then men have the means whereby they can fashion the matrix of the spirit. For the spirit is one, it is God. But God's spirit cannot be molded into an imperfect matrix and thus men perceive that they themselves must become the executioners of their own freedom. They must create and harbor 
in consciousness the means to create the very body of soul substance with which they shall walk into the eternal presence. Unless they do, the substance which they have will grow less and less and wane continually. But if they do, the substance that they have will wax more and more until they have gathered enough to complete the incorporeal body with enough left over to lavish their love and energy upon their fellow men and upon those whose hands are extended in hope to receive learning caught in the miasma of misteaching spawned in the world by Antichrist. Mankind are indeed trapped in a web. It is from this web of delusion that we will deliver you one and all and the entire planet so that they can understand how to untangle the skein that resembles a ball of yarn tangled by a kitten until there is no longer any semblance of garment or reality or purpose in it, but only a hopeless, snarled situation from which man can scarcely expect to be in unentangled or disentangled. Now then we come to you, won't you please be seated. With the supreme purpose in view that God's ideas are superior to man's. And if God's ideas are superior to man's, why do we find men looking continually into the world of man as though the world of man would possess the means or wherewithal to free them from the bondage in which all men find themselves? Well, men do not know that they are bound. They do not know that they are in bondage because they are themselves their own jailer. They have imprisoned themselves in a cage of their own creation. They have locked the door and thrown away the key. And they do not understand the need to escape from the prison of their own creation. Therefore, you must understand that the challenge of this age is for the enlightenment of men who have no desire to be enlightened, who have no desire for freedom who do not see themselves as prisoners, but rather as magistrates of their own destiny. Superior are they in their very thought. Is it any wonder then, as many have voiced in this activity, that mankind would often spurn the ascended master teaching simply because of the ignorance which they have fashioned in their own heart. You must then recognize the power of decrees to banish this ignoble state whereby men are tangled more and more and freed less and less. The spirit of freedom is abroad in the land. The spirit of freedom moves upon the waters. The spirit of freedom is in every breath that men take, but they do not know it. Their ignorance is as a dark curtain it descends and they live in a world from which God is shut out. But they know it not for they have created a substitute. Their own ego has become God in their world. And they decide what is best for themselves and permit no other to usurp that position. They have perverted the idea, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And now they say, I am the Lord, my God, and I will have no other gods above me. And thus mankind in this state of consciousness and mind are not really candidates for the ascension. And this is why so few come to us at Luxor in a relative sense out from the masses of mankind. And when I see the hunger in your hearts and the thirst for righteousness for yourselves, and I also see the hunger and thirst for righteousness that you have in your consciousness for others, I realize that it is also a reflection of the love of the ascended masters for the whole race. For we would, if we could, free all men from this terrible density. But there is a law functioning there of their being, whereby they have sealed themselves in this mortal sense, this mortal coil of unregenerate energies. And they ask not to be delivered. Therefore, those who ask truly shall find.
those who seek be illumined. And those who come to us see the doorway that leads to the temple beautiful, where the image of divine reality is returned to them once again. And they walk neath the skies of paradise, the blue of his holy will, and see the azure sea of his loveliness, his transmutative power to create even the passion of forgetfulness, blotting out the iniquities of mankind and gazing upon their records no more once they have passed beyond a certain point in initiation. And thus the soul does fly to Buddhahood to the budding of eternal youth, to the budding of eternal truth, to the realization that God in action is initiation, a manifestation of man finding his place in eternal life, a place which God hath prepared for him and for those that love him. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there may ye be also. And thus, with the Lord Christ's word, and consciousness, we invoke once again your understanding and affirmation of the need to take the sword of the Spirit in hand to carve out peace in the world by the sword of spiritual action. Mankind are trapped in a web of psychic weaving by darkened forces poisoned and deceiving, confusion, voiced by many voices, trembles in the air, and life without understanding fears and groundless finds itself unfounded in reality but lost in mortal brutality. Reason wanes and confusion reigns in thoughts and vortices of hate that mankind are prone to call our fate. We see the means to free them all, but know the shroud that sense them does enthrall to bring about a cloud of terror that will burst against their feet. We who see the life of heaven know that God has in store a treat of wondrous love that falls as flowers from on high. Be joyous and know I live, and as I live, none of you shall die, for God in you is life that springs up from the grave of sense confusion, be not afraid, for lo, it is I who speak the Master's voice to all who seek and make their choice. I am your freedom in ascension flame. Oh, won't you wrap yourself in that all-enfolding radiance in God's name? Then do it now and observe as flesh does drop as wax and you as flame to understand eternal flax that weaves the garment of the flame around about 
your self, your I am name, your being, large or small, that you who tremble on the brink of all that is will understand the universe that is and see the veil of Isis drawn. The way back to the heart of God takes brawn and more than muscle or than strength. It takes a filigree of God's intent, a patina of illumination, broad and true. All this and more will make a pathway to the sun for you, to freedom's gates, where lords of life and death await the conferring of the title true. I am a son of God, one with you and with all men. Oh, come then, listen as I call, for Serapis speaks to one and all. Your destiny is more within your hand and being mind and soul than any dream of you are in one great sense, the goal that God has dreamed of. You will manifest him. Hold that image then. Hold no image of mortal sin or din, but only love and light and life, and God himself will help you end the strife as potentials merge with sea and seer and seer bold who has the courage to penetrate the veil of old and see the works of elder art that God has wrought a thing that's not apart from all that in thyself is now a manifestation the gods do vow your freedom if you take that freedom in your hand as action, in your heart as passion, in your mind as illumination. Out of the sun I came, and from the temple of Luxor, clad with the ascension flame, and to that flame I returned as Zarathustra returned to his flame. So may everyone return to their flame, and all will merge into the oneness of the one flame, and the altar of heaven will, at that moment, as the great Manvantara ends, as the cosmic dance is done, bow the cosmic head of the Blessed One and commence again to manifest life eternal, virgin radiant, emanating into the sesophric rounds of a never-ending cosmic purpose beginning without ending, ending without beginning. I thank you.
gracious ones, the quickening of hope in every human heart is always a manifestation of the love of the eternal presence of life that beats that heart, invoking upon the altar thereof a realization that behind the veil of the personal illusion is the great winged God self, the divine exponent of freedom for every man. The world today steeped in the degradation of cumulative delusion does not understand reality. All reality, blessed ones, is in the heart of your presence fashioning for you one and all in the great infinite presence of life that expands throughout space and time the image of joy, abundant life, and God happiness. This is all captured within the flame of the immortal one the flame that translates itself into a semblance of reality in human persons, but never to manifest perfection until the ritual of the ascension has been completed by each life stream. Men feeding on their own illusions are often bereft of the great happiness of the God intent for them individually because illusion fosters illusion and by and by the veil becomes so thick and so strong an enclosure as to separate man almost totally from the real aspects of his identity. The temporal identity becomes then each man's nemesis, yet he deems it his friend. Men make friends with their outer selves and consider their outer selves to be closely identified with reality. However, the Ascended Masters, one and all blessed ones, know that the outer self is totally illusion, just as the inner self is the absolute, the infinite, the divine image. It is impossible for outer man to ever externalize his divinity until he identifies and is made one with it. Simply put, the outer self cannot inherit the kingdom, for flesh and blood cannot. Man is a spiritual being, and he must then discard those personal aspects of self-identity which cloud the reality of the divine self from view and prevent him, per se, from entering into an overcoming sense of cosmic grandeur, the nobility of the soul as it manifests its light complex, its wholeness, its complete freedom to express its latent divinity. Divinity is only latent in man because he lives so much in the outer sense consciousness and so little in the internal security of the eternal presence. This is no play upon words, gracious ones, but the manifestation of immortal keys to your freedom. At times it is difficult for us to reach through the veil coming as we do through 
our beloved messengers, who are subjected to many pressures which seek to impede the flow of our light energy, our wisdom, and our strength. We are, however, giving of our energy through the veil of outer person and through the veil of our messengers, transmuting wherever possible every shadow in their worlds and seeking eventually to produce that wide latitude of manifestation which will be to step through the veil of literal manifestation in form that the exact concept which we seek to voice will be understood by our auditors even as we ourselves speak it. We hope then that all will comprehend the need to penetrate not only the word sense of our releases from on high, but also the great spiritual afflatus of cosmic energy, the flow of our love and our preeminence as the manifestation of your eternal presence into your world. You see, beloved ones, the eternal presence acts. I am in you and you are in me. The eternal presence acts through the ascended masters and the radiation of that higher octave of light flows forth. You also, through identifying with the ascended masters in the world of form, permit the self-same God energy from on high to become congruent with your own and to flow through the human triad as monadic manifestation of the eternal one. The three agreeing in one body corporeal must be understood even as corporeal sense is grasped to convey the physical frame and form of the universe. But the mind penetrating substance must be known as the directing intelligence or universal sense consciousness which comes from God and is the manifestation of your own I am presence manifesting in form. This permeating Christ intelligence directing all manifestations of outer nature is also able, if it is given preeminence, to direct the intelligence of your body and mind and being until the triad of manifestation is a unity of oneness. Let all understand then that the spirit or the soul of God is also identified with man as the gift of the creator in its highest order is the gift of himself, identification with all creation, with all cosmos, with every ascended master, with every angel, deva, builder of form. And so the many become the one as the sense of each becomes the sense of all. We then seek to create in you the means of dispelling illusion that the divine flame pulsating within you will burn the veils of discordant energy, of negative thoughts, of false concepts of separation of self, and will show the divine reality blazing through as the passport of mankind to know their own freedom. Freedom is the freedom to enter into the real and the heart of the real. Freedom is not the license to manifest the whimsy of the human will. It is the great identification with the one, the presence of love, 
life and light everywhere manifest. But there is a vibratory action. There is an essential realization that must come to all. It may come in many ways, not necessarily identifiable in word concepts, but as an actualization of the presence that once realized by man merges that realization with the whole in such a manner as to seem wholly natural. This is the absorption of the inlet into the sea, of the drop into the ocean, of the one separated monad into the total monadic self. When this is done in a natural manner, there is no sense of pressure that is brought about or struggle. Simply the beautiful, sweet satisfaction of expanding being. But when it is done through force and from lower levels of manifestation, there is always the sense of struggle that makes that struggle. And when it is done even from heights, far above the realm of the ordinary man's mind, as a leap into cosmic arms, there is the onrushing sense of absorption. This is unnecessary, and it too provides some element of struggle, for individuals actually seek to impede their own onrush of progress into the Godhead in order to effect greater comfortability for the ego diminishing as it becomes the ego increasing. Let all understand then that the naturalness of cosmic life is to manifest the great love of God's heart and the willingness to blend the complete manifestation of self garnered through the whole journey of man's manifestation into the eternal with no sense of struggle or desire to resist that blending. This seems to men to be contrary to themselves, and it seems to them to be a merging unto death. It is not. It is a merging and the only merging unto life. Without it, men could never attain or achieve spiritual integration, and they would remain continually in the round of struggle and sense consciousness. Dispel your illusions then concerning absorption into the heart of God and have no fear of that absorption. It is home to us who dwell within it and seek ever each day to become more of the infinite and less of finite manifestation, even residual, which manifests in the ascended masters as person transmuted into a God flame. This must be understood in depth as showing the meaning of total absorption wherein the Father receives the Son that they may both become one and then ultimates in the Son himself bowing unto the Father that God may be all in all. Let men understand the meaning of all of this. For well, the purposes of life were to convey life, and life could not be conveyed without realization and awareness, and therefore consciousness came from God and was sent unto man as his highest gift in order that man might become one with God. <coughs> without consciousness of identity, without consciousness of self, there would have been no mirror into which the eternal could have projected his light. And thus, self-identity was that mirror. It has borne down through the ages the reflection of many illicit images other than the one intended to be conveyed. 
But that matters not. When the inlet finds its entree into the sea of being and identifies with the allness of God, the splendor of true reality is mirrored. And in that outpicturing, the Son becomes one with the Father. And there is no loss to either. For God desired it to be so, and the Son desires it also. Thus, out of one did he make many, and out of many will he one day make one. Every ascended master, every cosmic being, welcomes above all things our entree into that grand heart of eternal purpose. But we see as a part of our service to life the giving of our energies and attention to you even on a personal level many times in order that we may assist you to find that self-same harmonium of being that we know in part that all shall become in whole. I thank you. Beloved ones, the purity of divine expression is a tender and fragile thing. Let all understand then the need to balance in the force field of their identity that magnificent God flame of immortal perfection tripartite in nature, but endowing man with the divine sense of balance by which he is able to achieve a realization of cosmic culture and appreciation for each blessed moment which God gives unto man. In our brotherhood, the supreme idea is what? is good for the soul. What can still 
the restless confusions in the hearts and beings of men. And therefore, even in symmetry and form, we strive for an expression of loveliness as an avenue to the divine. That men beholding our works of art may themselves be inspired by them and relate themselves to a higher order and form. The supremacy of infinite purpose then is realized at that moment by all who behold art. This art then becomes beauty in the eye of the beholder and a many splendid thing keying again and again those responses in thought and feeling that are akin to the Creator's own concept held in mind and cherished through the making process whereby God externalizes among men through his instruments the methods in full view of all life that will enable them to themselves grasp the thoughts of the Creator and the Creator's good servant, the artist, the musician, the Creator in form, who first creates in thought and in feeling the magnificent momentums that come not into full focus in of necessity one moment but are betimes the study of lifetimes of service and desire desire to serve mankind not for the sake of glory not for the sake of recognition but to serve as an artist of the spirit to create those designs which will afford men to see the splendid visions of the future which the ascended masters desire to spread abroad in consciousness for consciousness is indeed my friends a fertile field where the divine seeds may fall and have a rich and full-bodied harvest of illumination and strength of love and of love for the object of one's affection. You must understand that love is not only a gettingness, but love is also a giving. Where there is greater blessing conveyed in the sense of the giving, even than the getting born of necessity for in the circle of lives there is always a return a return of energies to each precious individual who sends forth into the universe some desire for service and the expression of those cosmic modes which are often expressed most arbitrarily by individuals for they do not always understand them with the full focus of consciousness, but often instead are simply moved by certain conditions of heart and mind without understanding the whys or wherefores at all. We are not concerned with any of this, but we are concerned that the divine expression may expand itself in the dimensions of each individual's consciousness for it is consciousness that has the need to expand as a chalice not to stay a certain fixed size in a spatial sense but to reach out for an ever widening grasp of universal thought and feeling this requires attention upon the deity. For while there may exist in the world of form those unfortunate hazards to young life known as mind-expanding drugs, 
we know that the wings of the Spirit will safely enable men through their own latent inspirations awakened and quickened by the Holy Spirit to reach out into the universal consciousness and pulsate vibrationally in consonance with the divine. There are many avenues by which men may expand their consciousness and God is not particular to call a halt to safe attitudes that desire to expand into the force field of the divine. For attitudes are most important. Individuals ought then to generate within themselves those tender responses of attitude that are chased toward the deity. They ought to understand that faith in the deity is an essential ingredient if God is to manifest within the force field of themselves. They must not only believe that God is but understand that he is the rewarder of diligence. And therefore, if men are hungry to be fed the divine manna, the beauty and culture of the spirit, they must sow the divine seeds of culture and beauty as they apprehend it within the force field of their own consciousness. This must not be a nebulous thing fraught with doubt. It must be a specific intent to garner from the field of the world in every way that they can those thoughts and ideas that will produce kinship with the divine. Pre-essence of the divine intent is also a valuable adjunct to the seeker to grasp in thought and feeling that God's love is a tender reality of each precious moment, does itself create a sense of divine beauty and imminence. The imminence of the divine, God will draw nigh unto you as you draw nigh unto him, is not a platitude but a formula. It is a formula whereby you may bridge the chasms of doubt and distress and walk safely across into a radiant field where the light stands in all of its joyous appearance. A mighty thing of wonder. Moses saw it, and he said, I will go apart and see now what this thing is, this bush that is aflame, which is not consumed. And thus there are many ever-present realities in the field of art, of science, of philosophy, of religion, and of many departments of life whereby individuals are able to go apart and to see this miracle of infinite creation that surrounds the world even as the ocean surrounds the little fishes in the sea. Let men then understand that everywhere there are miniature breaks in the garment that opaques the light. And through these rents in the veil, the gleams of the spirit do shine. And they bring renewed hope to those who will recognize this reality as nigh unto themselves. Blessed are they who are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. To see God within the form of self. To see God within the mind of self. To see God within the emotions of the self. Are to bring about and effectuate a tenderness in the entire schema. A tenderness of thought and feeling that trembles in delight and ecstasy as to just what each new moment will bring forth. Will it be an essential manifestation that will carry the soul forward as a cool mountain stream? Or will it be a temporary stagnation for reflection in a calm pool of being? Or will it be the cascading rapids that move 
the consciousness on, ever upward, ever downward, rising and falling, undulating, because in the relative sense there is no up or down, but only movement, flow, as Meru has said, of the cascading consciousness of being. And what delightful surprises are just around the bend for many who will summon the faith by faith in God's purposes that elects for themselves a higher walk that is not satisfied with outer conditions, that is not satisfied with the past, but yearns to move forward in to that glorious veiled future which God tenderly reveals unto his children because their love flows out to him as the connecting link between that great eternal presence and the self. The self is in reality a fragile, tender thing, but it is beloved as it opens itself its tiny eyes unto the light, an ever-widening aperture, a ever-receding panorama, vision transcending itself again and again, capturing new moments of new hope and faith. This is the purposes of life. It is a great tragedy and no comic purpose whatsoever that causes men to fail to perceive reality when it is all around them. And so tonight, my plea to all who hear with the inner ear is to listen closely to the God that within speaks to each soul, the God within who caresses each consciousness, the God within who is also the God without. He is beautiful of heart. Beautiful are his feet that have moved in the world of form to leave permanent markings of infinite love and light right where man is so that man can grasp these hopes again and again and break the matrices of old and callous action understanding the need for recognition of the purity of the divine seed within themselves. There is no sacrifice in offering one's all to cosmic purpose. There is only the blending, the harmonious blending with the light that is everywhere and yet is nowhere unless men perceive it. For if the light goes out in human consciousness and purpose seems dim, it is because reality is not contacted. And there is then one solution and one alone, and that is to come by faith in a journey on the great boat of reality to where reality is. If this requires movement, well and good. If it requires a stationary activity wherein the movement is from within, well and good. For both are necessary. There is a time to move and a time to be still. And men must understand the need to perceive which time is in readiness at a given moment. We then tonight will give you these simple thoughts based upon the great purposes of the light because it is the light of divine love and divine love alone that will serve as a beacon for those who open the doors of their consciousness to that sublime reality that is captured within the countenance of the newborn and sometimes is caught as the dying light on the face of the aged, whose hopes are reaching out beyond for a new beginning or the finis to a career of service to the Most High. 
Great is the universe, wide, magnificent. Let grasp be as wide as the universe, as magnificent as God's mind, and then the sea of being will encompass thee all around, and you will see that life does by fire abound to create a matrix ever new to make you one of the very few who elect to be and see their God to understand the might of rod of cosmic law that chastens some and moves men forward till they're one. I thank you.